Welcome to the Graduate Institute in Conversation with podcast series. I'm Lena Menger, Outreach Officer at the Graduate Institute. In this series, we ask renowned experts and thought leaders to address pressing global issues with a Graduate Institute faculty member. This episode features a discussion with Philip Sands, Professor of Laws and Director of the Centre on International Courts and Tribunals at University College London and Zachary Douglas, Professor in International Law at the Graduate Institute Geneva. Philip Sands explains the challenges he faced while writing his new book, The Rat Line, Love, Lies and Justice on the Trail of a Nazi Fugitive. The investigation into the life of Otto von Dechter, a senior Nazi indicated for mass murder, also shows how his son still believes in the innocence and decency of his father, despite facts and evidence. Philip Sands stresses that part of this project was to make the audience understand that we must not exclude the personal from our assessment of the narrative and why certain things happen. Well, Philippe, good morning. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I'm going to dive straight into the rat line, the, your new book, uh, which of course is the, the sequel to the phenomenally successful East West Street. And I want to ask you first about the, the writing process, uh, because in East West Street, you, you explored, you uncovered your, your family's secret history. Uh, it's a deeply personal book, um, whereas the, the rat lines, the, the focus is more on the lives of others. Then obviously, there's still connections with your family history, but the, the drama really focuses uh, around your biographical pursuit of Otto von Wachter, uh, a key figure in the, the Nazi regime. So how did the, the writing process for each book compare? And, and I say uh, the, the questions of interest, I think, because there must have been, in writing East West Street in particular, there must have been moments of personal distress, maybe even trauma. Uh, and so did the greater distance with the, the subject of the red line make it easier to, to write, or was the energy uh, the, from the moments of distress in East West Street so difficult to, to recreate for the rat line. Well, Zach, first, it's incredibly nice to do this podcast and especially nice to do it with you. Um, so, you know, as a uh, international lawyer, an academic and a practitioner, that one of the things that is ingrained in us from the get-go of our academic and practical professional lives is we don't talk about ourselves. And for 30 years, that is how I've proceeded in my academic writing and in you know, cases that I'm involved in either as counsel or as arbitrator. And I'd written many books, 14, 15 academic books that I'm very happy to have written. And uh, beginning in 2005 with a book I wrote called Lawless World, I decided I wanted to reach a bigger audience. And Lawless World was followed by a book called Torture Team, which looked at the Bush administration lawyers and the authorization of techniques of interrogation that I say amount to torture. And gradually, in the process of writing those two books, to reach a bigger audience on subjects of international law, I had to adopt a style that was more accessible. But the big change came, as you've rightly said, with East West Street, where for the first time, I wrote overtly about myself. I positioned myself in the story, which is, for some people, a controversial thing to do. And I talked about my own family. That book took five and a half years to write. And part of the challenge of writing the book was precisely the one you've put your finger on, namely an editor having to pull me kicking and screaming out of decades of excluding the self. So the first difficulty was to get me to write about um, my family in the first person in a book that dealt also obviously with the origins of aspects of international law, crimes against humanity and genocide. The second difficulty and challenge was to write about a man I knew very well, my grandfather, Leon Buchholz, who lived until I was 37 years old, but who never once talked about what happened in 1945 or before 1945. And of course, as you know from the book, that required addressing issues of what happened to his family, a possible question of paternity of my mother. Was my grandfather actually my mother's father or was it someone else? And these raised serious challenges, and that meant time. And I was put in the hands of a wonderful um, editor in New York, Vicki Wilson, to whom I'm eternally grateful. And she literally line edited 
four different 150,000 uh, word drafts, which were written between 2012 and 2015. The book was published in 2016. And it was a slow and painful process. There was one moment only which was particularly difficult, and that was uh, the question of uh, engaging in a DNA test. I tracked down a lady in Long Island in New York State uh, who was the granddaughter of the man I learned was my grandmother's lover. And she said, let's do a DNA test. And um, I said, sure. Uh, The DNA test sample packages arrived. She sent an email saying I did mine in one and a half minutes. Mine just sat on my desk for six months because uh, I was faced with the challenge of asking myself the question, what right did I have as a son and a grandson to impose on my mother, who is alive and well and who I'm close to, matters that could be devastating for her? So, yes, there were real personal challenges um, in writing East West Strait. I remember when the, the reading about the DNS DNA test coming back. I think you mentioned it in the first book, and, and I think the conclusion was something like that you were seventy three percent Jewish, and and you remarked that was a rather strange uh, result to, to to have in the in the DNA results. Um, raises all sorts of other issues, but could I press you a little bit more on the on the personal things, if, if, yeah. if you don't mind? Cool. And you, push it wherever you want to go, Zach. Push it wherever you okay. want to go. We'll go personal, then. Um, you you alluded to obviously the uh, the question of whether or not your your grandfather Leon was actually your biological grandfather at all. You reflect upon his sexuality. Um, you present evidence that your grandmother Rita was was having an affair with someone else not long after. I think she married Leon, and I think that there's there's quite a lot of speculation that she may have stayed in Vienna for almost two years after Leon had departed for Paris, uh, actually to to remain there uh, with her lover. Now, of course, you tell all those things with a, a great deal of sympathy and and sensitivity, but but you tell them nonetheless. Uh, and so, how how did you come to the decision to to publish what you were discovering about your your own family's secret history? And, and in particular, you must have had some very awkward moments with with your mother as 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 you were recounting these things that she was discovering for for the first time. You know, I think both the books East West and Ratline are books written by an academic international lawyer who has spent years sitting in places like the International Court of Justice and it loss and doing arbitrations and stuff. And you learn in those cases many things. But one of the things you learn is that a case can often turn on a tiny point of detail. And we as international lawyers may not be good for much. But I think one thing we are able to do, some of us at least, is engage in fact-finding. And one of the things I've really come to appreciate over time is the training in how to find things out, how you use archives, how you interview people, how you gather evidence, documentary, testamentary, other video photographs, and so on and so forth, how you assess it, how you keep an open mind always because things are never entirely just what they seem. And the way I think of it is in writing both the books, as in doing the factual elements of particular cases, you 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 begin on a process, you find yourself in a space, you come to a door, which leads you in a particular direction, you enter the door, you find yourself in another space, and there are three more doors. And you just end up keeping on going through the doors. And so bit by bit, you uncover things. You then have to decide, as in a case, What are you going to put in? What are you going to leave out? One of the things my editor said to me that I hadn't fully appreciated is she said, Philippe, it's not just what you find that is interesting to the reader. It's the process of finding it. And that's why in both books, I describe um, that exercise. So what happened and the matters you deal with, the relationship of my grandparents, of course, I knew my grandparents. They lived next to the Gare du Nord. I would stay there as a kid. I was very close to them, particularly to my grandfather. I sensed, as my brother did, perhaps their marriage wasn't great, but they'd stuck together, as that generation, I think, often did. And I 
opened a door when I went to Lviv in 2010 to find my grandfather's house and the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity and kept pushing. And one thing led to another. And I uncovered things about their lives in Vienna. But in particular, through the passports that they traveled from Vienna to Paris with, my grandparents and my mother between 1939 and 1941, I learned that they traveled separately. And this was a remarkable. I was able to work out, surmise from the different travel dates, that something else must have intervened. What was that something else? You know, I think you and I are cut from the same cloth. We were like dogs with a bone. Once we need to find something out, nothing will stop us. We, I'm quite obsessive about trying to get to the truth. Whatever the truth is, and that's again something that you do in a case, it might be for you, it might be against you. You just want to know what it is. Uh, and in relation to my grandparents' relationship, I then came across some documents which were not given to me by my mother immediately, but one document in particular from which it became clear that something had intervened, another person had intervened, a man had intervened in my grandmother's life. And that became the clue to unlocking a mystery. And then um, another series of letters emerged, or I read letters that I already had in a different light, and in particular, a series of exchanges between my grandfather, Leon, and his best friend, Max, who ended up living, escaping and living in Los Angeles. And from that, I was able to deduce, to deduce other things. And yes, it's um, delicate and difficult, but one of the things I decided I had to do was share everything with my mother. It wasn't clear to me when I would do that, um, but she needed to know everything that was in the book. And interestingly, um, in that regard, I had put in the final draft, um, in the page proofs, the story about the DNA, and I'd given my mum the page proofs. And then when the book was finally published, uh, I gave her a copy of the book and we saw each other and she said, amazing. Philippe, amazing that you did all that extra work between the page proofs and the final version of the book. And I said, what do you mean? It's the same. She said, no, it's not. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, that stuff about the DNA test, that wasn't in the page proofs. And of course, it was in the page proofs. And she had you know, disconnected in some way and excluded from her memory or her mind something which must have been delicate and difficult for her and forgotten about it, cut it out. And I think one of the things the writing of this book teaches me a lot is how the human brain works in relation to memory and how we forget certain things and how we remember certain things and how we rewrite certain things. Well, did you remember the conversation with her when you discovered that actually she had traveled to Paris from Vienna separately from both parents at the age of, I think, one years old? Uh, in in the custody of uh, almost a complete stranger, a, a, a very benevolent uh, complete stranger, but but nonetheless, um, without either of her parents, uh, it must have been quite a, a devastating thing to, to discover, especially given the circumstances of why her father might have left and her mother might have stayed behind. So that journey, she did indeed travel at the age of one. Uh, alone uh, with a uh, lady called Elsie Tilney, an evangelical Christian missionary, to whom I think I, it's fair to say I owe my existence. In fact, I can go further and say that having discovered that Miss Tilney did what she did in saving Jews and others from Nazi atrocities, was motivated by a particular reading by her pastor of Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 10, verse 1. And I exist because of those lines. Literally, I think that can be concluded. My mother has no memory, of course. She was one year old. But more than that, she has no memory of what happened next. She has no memory of the first five, six years of her life. She arrives in Paris. She lives with her father uh, for a year. And then the Germans arrive in June 1940. And she is put into hiding in a small town called Meudon, just south of Paris. And she has no recollection. She remembers a few things. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, that I think her parents must have told. She remembered that she had two names. Um, she had her own real birth name, and then she had another false name uh, that was given to her, Jocelyn. I mean, her real name is Ruth, and she became Jocelyn. Um, 
and she remembers or says she remembers when uh, being asked, what's your name? She would answer as a little girl, ça dépend, it depends. And I think the damage that must do to a child of that age to have a double identity, I mean, you have children, I have children, that sense of not knowing who you are and how you can present yourself, being disconnected for the first four or five years of your life from one or both of your parents must have huge implications. And the effect is she's just completely cut it out. So she sort of marvels that somehow I've managed with this research to reconstruct what happened, I think to a pretty high but not total degree of accuracy. And the truth is, when she read the final versions of the book, she fessed up. She said, you know, I knew there was a problem with my parents' marriage, and I always suspected there had been someone else. And then little stories started tumbling out, including uh, one conversation that she had with her own mother uh, walking along the Finchley Road in London, where her mother said to her, as a word of advice, as a decent woman, you must always love at least two men. And that sort of confirmed in an indirect way. You know, we we know you can take evidence so far and how much reliance you can place on documents, on the interpretation of documents. It's a very delicate and difficult thing. And so, you will have picked up in both the books, there is an element of restraint. I don't make far-reaching conclusions. I let the reader form their own view as to what the material will or will not bear or what different interpretations will allow. And I think that's been part of the reason that the book has done well with non-lawyers because they've appreciated the opportunity. It turns out there's a lot of smart people out there who are amazingly interested in international law. So it's the blending of the personal issue with the big political legal uh, issues that I think has been the challenge for me, but it seems to have been the magic that has made these books work. Well, also the, the, the moral conundrums which um, are exposed um, by, by the books, and I, I want to get onto that now in, in the rat line. Obviously, the drama here centers around your detective work on the trail of uh, Otto van Vakta. But each time you make uh, some sort of a breakthrough in exposing his role in the Nazi atrocities or uh, exposing what happened to him on his life, uh, in his, during his life on the run after the collapse of the Third Reich, you, you make a point. Uh, of sharing whatever your discovery uh, is with his son, Hurst, Horst, I should say. And you record um, his reaction uh, to the discovery uh, each time uh, during the book. Now, just to give a bit of background, Horst, he was born in 1939. He's now in his 80s. I think it's fair to say he doesn't accept his father's culpability as a, as a mass murderer. But at the same time, he gives you complete access to his parents' personal archives. And it was only because of that access that made the writing of the rat line possible. And, and I guess it might be also said that it was only access to that archive that led you to be able to make further discoveries uh, about um, Otto's role in, in the atrocities. So why did, why did Horst, uh, given his position, give you access to the archives? And, and how on earth did you persuade him? It's a good question. I mean, you said right at the beginning, in a sense, the rat line is a less personal book. And, and that's right in one sense. I don't wear sort of my family on the sleeve. But of course, right at the beginning, it is clear to the reader that the Wächter family is of particular interest to me because Otto Wächter was governor of Lemberg, the city that is today Lviv in Ukraine. And as governor, he oversaw the extermination of the uh, family of my grandfather. And so I'm essentially tracing the story of a man and his wife, because Charlotte plays a very big role, uh, who uh, had a dramatic impact on the well-being of my grandfather. And that underpins, but is not done overtly, the entire story. Of course, Wächter is also responsible, or one of those responsible, for the deaths of the entire Lauterpacht family, Hirsch Lauterpacht's parents, brothers and sister, nephews, nieces, cousins, and so on and so forth. Indeed, remarkably, Otto Wächter entered the University of Vienna Law School in October 1919, I think on the same day uh, as Hirsch Lauterpacht. And 25 years later, um, is responsible for the killing of Lauterpacht's entire family in Lemberg. You, you sort of couldn't um, invent it. So I got to Horse in an indirect way. I, East West Street is essentially about 
one of the four characters is a guy called Hans Frank, another lawyer, a very fine lawyer, um, who did dastardly things. Hitler's personal lawyer from 1928 to 1932, 33. And uh, at a certain point, I met Hans Frank's son, Nicholas, uh, who uh, I came to know and befriended. And at one point, Nicholas said to me, you know, you should meet, since you're interested in Lemberg, you'll want to know about Gouverneur Wächter. Uh, why don't you meet his son? Maybe he'll want to meet you. And one thing led to another. We met. It was early 2012. Nicholas Frank and I went together to Hagenberg, northern Austria, just uh, north of Vienna, and met a very genial, sweet, and rather lovely man who has a very different view from Nicholas. Nicholas detests his father. First day I met Nicholas, back in 2012, I was doing a hearing at the International Seegerichtshof, Itlos, in Hamburg, and I met him on the terrace of the hotel we always stay in, the wonderful hotel Jakob. And as I encountered him for the first time, he said to me, Philippe, you need to know I'm against the death penalty in all cases except the case of my father. He deserved to be hanged for what he did. He hates his father. But he said, you'll be interested in Horst because unlike me, he feels positive things about his father, doesn't believe his father was a criminal, thinks he was a good guy. And that was the starting point of the relationship. Anyway, one thing led to another. I wrote a profile of Horst in the Financial Times. That then led to a BBC documentary, My Nazi Legacy, my relationship with Nicholas and Horst. And in the course of filming, Nicholas says of Horst in an interview with me, yes, I think he could be a new Nazi. And Horst is upset and outraged. And indeed, they have not spoken since then. And Horst says to me at one point, how do I prove I'm not a Nazi? Which is sort of an interesting way of putting the question. I, I said to him, I don't think you're a Nazi. Uh, I think your, your, your views of your father do not mean you are a Nazi. Um, but what about giving the family archive that I understand you to have? He had by now shared with me a few pages of a diary, an odd letter, but I didn't know the extent of it. But I knew there was a lot that had passed between his mother and father from the day they met in 29 to the day he died in 49, so over 20 years. Why don't you give that archive to a museum? And then researchers can look at it and form their own view as to what your father and mother did and did not believe and do. And he said, great idea. Which, which museum should I give it to? I thought about it. And the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, which was well-funded, a federal institution in the US, would do the work seriously in digitizing all the material uh, I recommended. He accepted. They came over, digitized 10,000 pages of documents, dozens of gigabytes. And when it was done in the spring of 2015, Horst said, would you like a copy of the USB? I didn't really chase for it, and um, he offered to give it. And I said, I'd love to. And a couple of weeks later, through my letterbox in London, popped a tatty envelope, reused about 18 times, a USB stick, which I put into my computer, and there was this just mass of unbelievable material. And frankly, I wouldn't have done much with it, except we had a dinner party at which one of the guests was the wonderful historian Lisa Jardine, a colleague at UCL, the director of the Center for Lives and Letters. And I told her about this USB oral document. She was already very sick. She had cancer. She died a year later. And she said, let's work on it. Let's, let's look at what these documents tell us, the private lives of these major figures at the top Nazi table. And in particular, you've got a, a wife's letters and diaries, which is extraordinarily interesting. And a few weeks later, I met with her and one of her PhD students and a couple of my LLM students at UCL, and we were off transcribing and digitizing. That became the Ratline podcast, which was broadcast in 2018. But while we were making the podcast, my editor said, surely you're going to write this into a book. And I, I wasn't going to. Um, but as we made the podcast, I basically wrote the book. And so one thing led to another. At each stage, the biography of the portrait of Horst in the FT, the film, the BBC film in 2015, the podcast in 2018, there would be a ritual. Within a few days, Horst would write to me and say, I hate what you've done. You've, you've misrepresented my great father. I'm breaking off all relations. And then a, within two months, he'd be back and say, no, let's carry on talking. I'm going to try to persuade you. I didn't persuade him of anything. He didn't persuade me of anything. But our relationship is maintained and we are still in touch. Indeed, the book will be launched in German uh, at an event in Vienna, uh, in Austria, in a couple of months. And, uh, of course, horse will come. It, it's 
it's extraordinary this juxtaposition between Nicholas and Horst, and, and that's done very well in, in both books. I mean, they're clearly both traumatized by their father's legacy. I mean, Nicholas, uh, you record him saying that he looks at the photo of his father dead after hanging every day to remind him to be sure that he's dead. Uh, Horst is, is, is clearly uh, suffering at some point, uh, at least, or some way at least, to, by, by virtue of the same trauma. I mean, it must be an extraordinary or appalling way to start your adult life, to become aware that your father was a senior member of the SS, uh, and you're carrying around that baggage for the rest of your life. There's nothing you can do about it. It's a biological link, and obviously something you had no choice in. Now, both obviously approach their father's legacy differently, is there any sense that you were trying, consciously or otherwise, to get Horst to the same place as Nicholas in terms of his relationship with his father's legacy? Absolutely. I mean, you could you could you could interpret it in many different ways. I mean, it could be, you know, that this is the trial that Otto Vechter never had. Um, he was indicted in 1945 for mass murder. If he had been caught, like all of his colleagues whether by the International Military Tribunal or the US Military Tribunal or the Polish National Tribunals or indeed a host of other domestic tribunals, he would have been charged with crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide. Um, and he would have been convicted and he would 100% have hanged, as did all of his colleagues, Seisinkvart, Frank. I mean, they were all, all of them who were caught and tried were all uh, convicted and, ha and sentenced to death. Um, and he was he was right up there on that table um, with them. So Horst's narrative is, yes, my father was indicted, but he was never caught. And so he was never tried. He was never convicted. He was never sentenced. He died an innocent man. And he says, Philippe, your logic and your training as a lawyer leads you to accept that conclusion. And of course, he's right in a formal sense. And of course, that has led me to reflect a lot on the unintended consequences of the move to international criminal justice, where you get a handful of people who are caught, tried, convicted, but dozens or hundreds or thousands or even more of others are not. And there are the Horst-type narratives in each family. And Horst takes refuge in the idea that his father died an innocent man and takes exception to my describing him as a mass murderer. He said to me, I describe in the book, you are never to say in my presence that my father is a mass murderer. And the book ends, I don't want to give it all away now, of course, on a dramatic intervention from his daughter, so Otto Wächter's granddaughter, on precisely that issue, which has had dramatic consequences since the book even came out and the podcast came out with, with the family. One observation, Nicholas struggles with the legacy of his father. It's obviously very painful and touches him very deeply. And, and, and it doesn't affect Horst in the same way. And in relation to those two, at least, it does seem that life is a lot easier if you are in complete denial about the facts. Horst wakes up every morning with a, you know, a spring in his step and gets out of bed and has a basically fairly decent day. And I don't think Nicholas's days are as easy or as tender as Horst's. And that's an interesting observation for me. Denial, silence, secrets tend to help people in this story better than the alternative view. Well, the way, the way Horst uh, defends his position, you record this um, throughout the book, he said, and I'll, I'll quote, he said, I have to do it for my parents to find good things. He says, I have to find some positive aspect. And for me, this is the most interesting than a moral question. Is it morally permissible for a son or a daughter of someone directly linked to the mass murder of civilians to search for or, de or defend what they perceive to be the good uh, in their parents? I mean, is that, do we give the latitude to the son and daughter but nobody else? Or, or do we insist that they have to condemn their, condemn their parents on the basis of the objective evidence? Or do, you know, do we make an exception for, for the son of the world? It's a huge question. You know, I grew up on one side of this big story, which was the side of a mother who had been a victim and of a grandfather and grandmother who had been victims. And so I got one narrative. And so I had spent, you know, 50 years of my life living through 
that narrative. And I'd never really encountered people from the other side. And it was a shock to meet Nicholas, because he was the first that I really came to know well, to see for myself and to begin to understand, because I don't think I can fully actually understand or imagine, what it means to have a parent who is hanged at the main Nuremberg trial for the murder of four million human beings. I mean, you alluded to it. You live with that. It is huge. What does that do to you? What does that do to your own children? And I've had remarkable interactions with Nick's daughter, Francesca, who's a remarkable human being, who describes to me how, when she was a child, her father would tell her what a terrible man her grandfather was. And she, as a teenager, worried that she had somehow acquired um, the DNA of her grandfather and might be a terrible person or a bad person or, de- or be prone to do dreadful and heinous thing. So the legacy goes on and on. But I understand what Horst is trying to do. I understand the desire of the son to find the good in the father and in the mother. That is not a dishonorable thing to do. I ask myself the question, how would I react to my father if my father did something equally terrible? It would be Would I hate my father? Would I disown my father? Would I have nothing to do with my father? I don't know what the answer to that question is. I can't even begin to imagine. Same with a child. You know, there's that book, we must talk about Kevin, I think it's called, where a a child becomes a mass murderer, a a high school killing, a Columbine style killing. Do we stop loving our child? Do we stop finding the good in our child? And one of the, it's not so much a critique, but it's observations about both East West Street and Ratline is that it is said that I'm quite generous towards towards both sons. And that uh, I remember I did one event at the Los Angeles Holocaust Museum and I was roundly attacked by a lovely lady who had been at Auschwitz and who said with tremendous passion and force, you don't describe Frank or Wächter as monsters. That's terrible. They're monsters. But my response to that is they're not only monsters. They are human beings who did monstrous things, criminal things, but they were also parents and husbands and lovers and friends who did decent and generous things. And you can't describe people only as black and white. And I think that is the complexity. I understand Horst's motivation actually to be primarily not about his father. He says on a few occasions, I didn't really know my father. It's about his mother. His mother loves his father. His mother venerates the father. He loves his mother. And therefore, this exercise in recasting his father's history is about protecting the integrity and honor of the mother. And I think that's what it's really about. And that's why, for me, the beating heart of the rat line is not so much Otto and not even Horst, although he's obviously a central figure, but Charlotta. Because for the first time... With the archive that Horst so generously gave me, we have the entire diaries and correspondence of a wife of a very senior Nazi. And from that, we are able to tell the story of a life of plenty, particularly when he took power and and her role as an enabler. And I've often wondered how it is with these kinds of characters. What is the role of the spouse? You know, again, bringing it back to my other life. Last December, I sat in the International Court of Justice in the Peace Palace as part of the delegation of the Gambia in the case against Myanmar and the Rohingya. And I sat but a few feet from Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, you know, one of the leaders of Myanmar, who was defending her country's interests as the head of their delegation. And I was asking myself, how can she do this? And I'd come to understand that it must be in some way also about her relationship with her father. Her father, who had founded the Tatmadaw, the what is now the army of Myanmar, a couple of years before Burmese Myanmar independence, was essentially engaged in what she was engaged in as a way of defending the honor of her relationship with her father. And I think as international lawyers, we see it with arbitrators, we see it with judges. You can never exclude the personal from what it is that motivates a human being and makes them do what they do. And I think part of this project is getting not only the grand public, but international lawyers to understand we must not exclude the personal from our assessment of the narrative and why certain things happen. 
It, it's absolutely fascinating. And as you say, that some of these moral questions are, are not black and white, which is make, what makes them so interesting. But perhaps we, could, we, can, we can finish on a slightly different topic, um, which is really what we can draw from this uh, to our, our, our present times. I mean, it's absurd to say that anything happening in the world at the moment is somehow akin to the atrocities committed by the Nazi regime. But equally, it seems absurd to say that we can't draw on the lessons from Nazi history until we get to the point where the rule of law is being suppressed completely and violence against individuals and minorities reaches some threshold that resembles the Third Reich. So it's the idea that history, it, it may not repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. Now, you've spent a huge amount of time uh, looking at Nazi war criminals under a mis- microscope. You've studied their character traits. You probably have some sort of feel for what conditions in the political, social environment unleash that sort of destructive energy in, in people. So here we are watching events unfold in, in Eastern Europe, in Brazil, in the United States, you know, even, even in your own country, in the United Kingdom. And it just seems that each week something happens that a year ago we thought that's very unlikely. Uh, and then five, and if we go back five years, we probably thought that was almost impossible. So are we in an incremental fashion getting to a dangerous place? Um, and what insights can we draw from you know, your meticulous study you know, in the, uh, the way the, the, the Nazi party came to power and everything else? Is it legitimate to even be drawing insights from, from that period of history? Uh, and what should we be doing about it? Yeah, that's a very pertinent question, Zach. I think, yes, uh, history doesn't repeat itself. But one of the central themes of the rat line having been through the life of Otto, the lives of Otto and Charlotte Wechter, is that one comes to appreciate that one thing leads to another. One way of looking at the path that Otto Wechter followed, 1921, he gets involved in protests, beating up Jews, he's sentenced to a week in prison, somehow gets through that, remains at law school, a couple of years later joins the Nazi party, one thing leads to another, in 34 he's involved in the putsch, uh, to kill, uh, get rid of the Dolphus regime and kill Chancellor Dolphus in Austria. He flees to Berlin. He spends four years there. And yet within four years, he's back on the balcony of the Heldenplatz after the Anschluss in, in Austria, standing with Hitler, uh, greeting massive crowds. And then he's up the greasy pole. And it doesn't start with a commitment to killing. But in the autumn of 38, Wächter is in, Wächter removes from office two of his own teachers at the University of Vienna Law Faculty. And they are in short order carted off to Theresienstadt from where they never return. Can you imagine that one of our students signing our own death warrants uh, 25 years after we taught them? it's, It's unimaginable. And then he's posted to Krakow and he creates a ghetto and then the ghetto is emptied and we now know people are exterminated. And then he's sent to Lemberg to do the same thing. One thing leads to another. And I think that, for me, is the big lesson. When you start tweaking with things, when you cross lines, you mentioned Britain. Just in the past two weeks, we've had the remarkable situation, for the first time, I think, in history, of a British government laying before Parliament a bill, a draft act of Parliament, which explicitly, on its face, commits a course of action which violates a treaty negotiated, signed, ratified and entered into force within just a period of just six months ago, a clear violation of the rule of law, of the international rule of law, in ways that have never happened before, that is a line crossed. Because once it's happened once, it can happen again. And we're seeing that in the United States. And how remarkable is it that in 2020, as we're about to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the start of the Nuremberg trial, And that 1945 moment when a sort of rules-based system was put in place very largely on the construction efforts of the United Kingdom and the United States, it is the UK and the US who are leading the efforts to tear down that system. You're in Geneva. Who would have imagined the United States leaving the World Health Organization? Is it unimaginable that very soon the United States might not leave the United Nations because the United Nations is, according to President Trump, like Uh, the WHO controlled by China. United Kingdom leaving um, the uh, European Union, negotiating a Brexit withdrawal agreement, implementing a 
Brexit withdrawal agreement, and then within six months of violating a Brexit withdrawal agreement, and doing so saying it accords to itself the right in accordance with its domestic law to make selective violations of international law. Absolutely, we are on a difficult path. And again, I go back to that moment in 1945. You know, on the 20th of November this year, that opening of the Nuremberg trial 75th anniversary will be marked. I'll be in courtroom 600 and I'll be there in conversation with the president of Germany, something which I think to my grandfather and mother would have been unimaginable uh, a, a few years ago. Who would have thought back then on that day, November the 20th, 1945, looking at who was in the dock, you know, 22 German Nazi leaders, that 20 that 75 years later, Germany would be the flag bearer for liberal democracy, for the idea of a rule of law internationally and domestically. And it would be the United Kingdom and the United States who are taking us hurtling towards an abyss. So times change. It's not the same. But I'm very fearful about where this will lead to. And I worry greatly about where this is heading. Well, just to end on, a, on another negative note, I have to get your reaction to an article in The Guardian last week. Um, it took a survey of young adults in the United States between 18 and 39. And the headline of the article was, nearly two thirds of US young adults unaware 6 million Jews killed in the Holocaust. And the subtitle read, 23% said they believe the Holocaust was a myth had been exaggerated, or they weren't sure. What was your reaction to that? Uh, I, yes, I saw, I saw the piece. I mean, in a sense, not a huge amount of surprise, because I think that um, with the passage of time, most people have not come across this subject. And increasingly, as they have come across it, they're you know exposed to takes on the historical record, um, which... Uh, obviously depart from the reality of what happened. I mean, it's extremely worrisome, um, as is, um, you know, in recent years in the United Kingdom, the rise of anti-Semitism on a particular sector of the Labour Party um, and under a particular leadership allowed uh, to flourish. Now, you, you know me well, Zach, I tend to be an optimist. I see the glass as half full rather than half empty. And I think there is still plenty of time uh, to right the ship. We've got an enormously important election coming up in the United States. I think it probably is the most important election of my lifetime and uh, of my lifetime in relation to the whole planet. Because I think if Donald Trump is re-elected, I think there is a real possibility, I'd put it even higher prospect, that the entire edifice created in 1945 could come tumbling down and we hurtle towards a, a very, very bad and dangerous situation. It is plain that when you have a US president saying he may not abide by the result, who wants to shred international agreements, who wants to you know, lock up immigrants, who wants to separate children, very young children from their parents where they've crossed illegally into the territory of the United States, you are in a place where literally anything could happen. This is a president who will do anything he can to promote his own interests and to keep his position. And I think that, particularly playing the race card, the white identity card, is a recipe for absolute disaster. I mean, I think over time, the situation will right itself, but I am fearful there will be tremendous damage before that happens. And of course, I'm a believer that we want the United States pushing as it has done, warts and all. I'm not starry-eyed about the country or what it has done internationally. But warts and all, it has done good things in terms of the international rule of law. And the idea that we have a world in which the United States is not pushing in that direction is, I think, deeply problematic. Philippe, thank you so much for your time. We're, we're, we're well and truly out of it. I, I guess we're going to have to go through the, the four and a half hours of my further questions at some other point. But, but thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was Philip Sens and Zachary Douglas discussing the emotional and psychological stratagems that people use to evade deeply inconvenient truths. For more information about the Graduate Institute, please visit graduateinstitute.ch. I'm Lena Menge. Thanks for listening.